We are just going to give a few minutes, let Stan get in here. As always, I will be going live here shortly with Stan and Rocco, who is our last week underdog, which was the pit bull. Cody Bearface says, pretty eyes. Uh, well, thank you, Cody. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, let me see. Hello, hello. What's up, brother? How you doing? Good, man. Good, man. How are you? Good, good. Hi. Say what's up. What? <laughs> so for everyone out there uh, that isn't familiar, yeah. Stan and his underdog, uh, uh, Pitbull Rocco, was our episode two last Wednesday underdog. So we're going to be spending the next 30, 45 minutes talking about the run, what went right, what went wrong. Um, all that fun stuff, taking your questions, see what questions you guys have for Stan or questions for myself. And so let's try to save some of your questions till the end. Let me uh, give everyone just a few minutes to get in the room and then I will get this started. Otto says, I agree with Cody. Thank you, Otto. Uh, JLS-35, thank you. Uh, let me see. Uh, Otto says Pitbull Power. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. So, again, quick recap for everyone tuning in. Uh, my man Stan here was on America's Top Dog on a &E last Wednesday, which was episode two, and as Pitbull Rocco. Um, I know he had a bunch of support. Everyone was loving you guys. So tell us, Stan, why did you choose, uh, before we get into the run, why did you choose to uh, pick Rocco to do America's Top Dog with out of all the dogs you could have chosen from? Oh, um, well, Rocco's my right-hand man. He's just kind of always been there for me. So they were like, hey, you got to do some obstacles and some stuff you've never done before. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. You know, we got a two-year-old over there, so <laughs> she's harder to train than Rocco was. So. For sure. But um, he's always he's always been there for me whenever I needed him. Um, people ask, how'd you get him to jump over jumps? I kind of just pointed at it, and he did it. So, I mean, I knew he'd be there for us whenever we needed him, so he was just a clear option for us to pick to, you know. And how, how old is uh, Rocco again for everyone? Uh, Rocco will be six on uh, Valentine's Day, actually. Okay, so he was five, six years old when he was competing on America's Top Dog. Yes, sir. We started awesome. training when he was a two-year-old. So you, you didn't get him until he was two? No, I had him since he was eight weeks old. Okay. I had no idea what I was doing until he was two years old. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> so Stan and Rocco is a great example that you can teach an old, older dog new tricks. Uh, you don't have to start as a puppy to get things on the right track. All right, so uh, fast forward, you get a chance, America's Top Dog, you're competing against, it's yourself, and you're competing against four highly trained, highly qualified police dogs, which are German Shepherds, Belgian Malinois. Um, when you knew that, when you obviously you know you have the six-year-old pit bull and who you only started working with a few years prior, and you know you're going against some legit Malinois, some legit German Shepherds that's training five days a week at their department. Um, did you, was, did, was that a little intimidating at all? Did that make you nervous at all? I mean, yeah, it's like, okay, they do this professionally, but I mean, Rocco's just, he's just pretty athletic. So, you know, the athletic stuff, I was like, hey, we're, we're right there. The drugs, you know, we'll get to that part later, but um it was it was actually pretty cool because um, Don with Bonito, she mm -hmm. goes, "Hey, I, I recognize you. You know, you got the boots and you got the pit bull. Like your I am Stan from Instagram. <laughs> like she had already <laughs> started seeing our videos before we got there. So she's like, man, I like you guys and da da da. So that kind of gave us a little bit comfort. It was like, okay, so you know, they're professionals too, but they've seen us and you know they're treating us as a professional as well. So it was." Yeah. Um, it was really cool. Yeah, for that, that, that. yeah that's the cool thing is I, I don't think uh, a lot of the people that were familiar with you uh, felt like it was a guaranteed win. 
You know what I mean? I don't yeah. feel like anyone saw you and Rocco and said, well, we're a police team and we know they don't stand a chance. So I feel like the respect that uh, went both ways. You guys, you respected them as challengers and they definitely have seen what you've done and they respected you as a challenger. So you were probably both a little bit nervous of each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's fast forward. You're on America's Top Dog. You're standing at the platform. Uh, my great co-host, who's an awesome guy, awesome professional commentator, uh, Kurt Menefee, we kind of joke around. We're like, what? So the first thing we're going to talk about is we're like, what's this guy doing? He's getting ready to run an obstacle course, <laughs> and he's wearing cowboy boots. And uh, so we were kind of talking amongst ourselves about it. He's like, so, Nick, like, what do you take on that? I'm like, I have no clue, Kirk. <laughs> I have no <laughs> expert analysis on why someone would do this. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about that. Why did you make that decision? Okay, so when we first started trading, we would just had sneakers on, right? And, um, you know, young puppies, they happy pee sometimes. And, you know, you're put petting them, petting them. So I was petting this pup, and my socks got really wet. So <laughs> I had, um, you know, urine-soaked socks. So Butch was like, hey, you might want to get you a pair of boots, you know, we do a lot of stuff here. Uh, Butch Capel is the guy who taught me how to train, and he gave me a chance, and we can get into that a little bit later as well. But he was like, get these pair of boots. They're really light. You know, they're comfortable. And I'm like, eh, black guy with cowboy boots. Yeah, that's not my <laughs> But they were really comfortable, and they just kind of became my trademark. I started decoying in them, started running in them, and then it was like, hey, this is your trademark, so just do what you do in them. So. So, so it was purely a a, a trademark look, and uh, you didn't think you didn't think it would aid whatsoever in speed, athleticism, or agility. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, you you were in the the military, so y'all used to run in boots all the time. So boots you know, and utes. That's <laughs> right. Yes, sir, sir, so. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so that answers the question I'm sure a lot of people want to know, because I was asked that question a lot. People was like, why did he pick cowboy boots to run an obstacle course that's a competition? I'm like, I have no idea, but we're about to find out. Uh, so, <laughs> And, of course, uh, we've got to represent for Texas. There you go. Yeah, uh, yeah. JPK9, Josh Panucci, what's up, man? Um, and uh, if you guys have some uh, – questions try to save them for about 20 minutes or now uh because then we'll i'll get in and specifically read through your questions so you're on the starting line uh round one the canine combine i believe you were the fourth team to go i believe you had bear Cato, and benito ahead of you so you got to see their times correct uh, or did you not i don't i don't think so if i remember okay. correctly we didn't know until afterwards okay so you're going in, you have no clue what Bear, Cato, or Benito did ahead of you, whether they smoked it, whether they were slow. So you're going in just knowing you're giving 100% and trying to smoke this thing. Mm -hmm. So you go. Um, let's start the canine combine. We start off at the car slalom. That's where you guys have to jump in and out of vehicles. You have to jump in either the back hatch or the back door and then come out the passenger side window so before you guys went i felt pretty confident that you guys would do well here a i know rocco a pit bull i know they got energy i know they got ups i know they got athleticism muscle all those things so i didn't question that and actually i told kurt i said i think uh he has an advantage here because he's smaller so it's easier for him to fit through those car windows than maybe the hundred pound German Shepherd. So you guys go through the first car, beautiful textbook, in and out. Now, when you go to the second car, uh, Rocco kind of like takes off towards the studio audience in the background. What happened there? What was going on? <laughs> um, so when we're on the podium, uh, the camera's walking up very slowly to, you know, us, and it's kind of coming out the shadows. So, um, Rocco thinks this is a monster, right? So, so kind of like some prey, some prey movement going on. Yeah, yeah. So he's growling, and I'm trying to <laughs> calm him down. Hey, it's okay. You know, we're not doing that just yet. You know, it's you know, we're just have, out here having fun. So um, he goes through the first car, then he's like, "Oh, I think that cameraman. I saw him over here." So he went to go look for <laughs> his bite, his prey, and uh, that's when you guys hear us say, "No." And it kind of, the light bulb just kind of clicked after that. And he was like, oh, we're not doing that. We're just out here having some fun. So, oh, what you want me to do, Daddy? Let's go. 
<laughs> okay, so so he kind of took off, and I remember, yeah, I remember you yelled really loud, no, and he came back very quickly, quickly recovered from it, which shows he respects, you know, your voice, verbals, uh, and then pretty much it was smooth sailing through the third and fourth car. He just had that slight couple second hiccup, and then it was pretty smooth for the rest of the car slalom. Now you guys approach the fire escape. Uh, you know, not to knock underdogs, but I always question, if you guys hear in my commentary, when the underdogs go, I always question them on the fire escape. Because I, I generally feel pretty confident a police dog, German Shepherd, a police dog, Dutch Shepherd, Malinois, if they see a dangly ball, I feel pretty confident that they are going to uh, grab it. You know what I mean? Yes, so yes. So I never question if a Malinois is going to grab a ball that's dangling in front of them. But when it comes to underdogs, I just don't know. As you know, it's a lot of genetics and, you know, the ball is a lot of the police dog's primary rewards. And I'm just not sure how you guys are going to do. So I was kind of questioning it. But actually, Rocco pretty much looked like a Belgian Malinois when it came to the fire escape. What do you attribute that to as, uh, for why he did so well there? Um, Butch Capel and his training style. So we didn't ever just train for a pattern. I taught him what the word bring meant was whatever it is. So if he saw the dangling shoe right there and I told him to bring it, uh, we teach him what the action means, not necessarily if it's a ball or a frisbee or a tug or anything like that. So uh, Butch Capel just teaching us to communicate with him because, I mean, let's think about it. Dogs are born knowing how to do everything we want them to do. So we just give them a time and a place. So I just gave him a time and a place to do the ball grab, and he responded. So Now, now for you, would you say that that's uh, because of the training behavior, or is he? would you, would you consider him a, a high ball-motivated dog still? he just likes to do stuff so if it kind of moves i mean he'll go get it and he's just i mean he's just always there for us and it's it's not i don't i, I don't know <laughs> to be honest i mean he just he just kind of does things so yeah he's driven but i mean if if it's food over here and a ball he's hungry he's gonna go eat go for the food yeah ball. so he kind of picks what he wants to do sometimes Perfect. Yeah, so he actually surprised me on the fire escape. I figured you guys would struggle a little bit on that, but he kind of looked like a Belgian Malinois just grabbing those balls with 100% enthusiasm. And then I think at the first fire escape, he leaped, you know, halfway up the staircase, you know, versus running up. He just jumped about four foot up and took off. Uh, so that was beautiful. And then it was pretty much the same story for the second and third level, just instantly grabbing, running up, all downhill. Now you guys get to the high jump. Here's a question I had, a lot of, probably a lot of people. Did you, did you know in advance that you were going to jump the wall with Rocco, or was that kind of a, just an in-the-moment executive decision that you made? Nah, I, I knew for, from as soon as they told us, you know, you may or may not have to do it with your dog. I said, I'm doing it regardless. <laughs> You're just not, and is that like, I'm not going to leave any room for air? I'm just because I know if I do it, he'll do it. What, what was the thinking behind that? Um, you know, like, exactly like you said, I know if I'm going over it, he's going to follow me through it. Even if he's unsure about it, he's like, well, you're going through it. All right, let's go. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, yeah, keep from the error, him getting distracted or anything like that. He's like, oh, this is what we're doing. Boom, let's go. Oh, we're going this. And, you know, you never want to send your dog to do something that, you know, you wouldn't do yourself. So Very true. Yeah, and, and that was beautiful to see how, how you guys, uh, you know, like the slow-mo video that A&E shows of you guys scaling the wall together. It's just a beautiful video. If you guys haven't seen it, it's in a lot of the trailers, Stan and Rocco kind of cresting the walls at the same time. I don't know who had uh, who looked better on the wall, whether it was Stan or Rocco, but, uh, <laughs> but they both did a great job over the walls. So you jump over the three foot, over the four foot. Uh, it was barrels, right? The four. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so then it was over the three barrels and then over the five foot together. Um, no issues whatsoever. You guys went over it amazingly well. Then Rocco, you guys get to the rope bridge. Flew through that, no issues. Did you now? Sometimes, even with our police dogs, you'll see some dogs have issues on the rope bridge. Is that have you guys done rope bridges before? Or just worked on some stability stuff, or um, we kind of would go to playgrounds and I put his tug places and kind of tell him to go get it. So we so he's just used to unstable surfaces. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So 
And again, he saw me going in front of him, and I told him, hey, you can do this. So he was like, all right, I can do it. Let's go. Yeah, so he flew across the rope bridge, which was beautiful to see. Now you guys get to splash down. Uh, you immediately, again, just like the wall, you immediately made the handler decision to, I'm going to go in the water. So you jump in that cold water at 2 a.m. in the Los Angeles desert. Yep. And uh, people don't realize it's pretty chilly, right, that water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't jacuzzi temperatures at all. <laughs> like, you know, no, no. It, it definitely woke you up. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it did. Um, for those that don't know, we actually film America's Top Dog from like 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. So it's literally in the middle of the night, uh, like in the desert canyons of Los Angeles. So you jump in immediately. And Rocco had a little bit of like uncertainty about getting in. Uh, what do you attribute that to? Do you guys not do a lot of water training or? Um, Rocco absolutely hates water. If it's raining outside, <laughs> if it's raining outside, he'd rather poop in the house and get in trouble than go outside and be in the rain. So, I mean, he absolutely hates it. And um, we had a couple friends of ours that we were training with. They let us use our pool and I'd get in and he'd, uh, okay, fine, I'll go in. So, you know, he'd go in. So, again, like you said, I jumped in because he was like, all right, you're going in. This is what we're doing. I may not want to, but let's go, Daddy. So so, so when you got to the splashdown, were you concerned at all? Like, man, he may not – I may not be able to get him in, or did you feel pretty confident that you could get him in? Uh, I felt pretty confident until I jumped in, and I didn't hear a – so then I'm turning around and there's water in my face and I'm like, man, is my dog in the water? Like, come on, come on, come on. And then <laughs> I see him coming. It's like, all right, let's go. <laughs> so you were a little nervous when you jumped in and only heard one splash. Yes. <laughs> it's like, no, he's going around. He's going around. Uh, so, yeah, it was just a few second delay. He kind of, you know, for those that don't remember, kind of slow crawled, inched his way in. Um, and I noticed you tried luring him with the tug. Uh, but he re once he was in the water, he really didn't care or want the tug, right? No, no. He was just like, I just get me out of here, then I'll worry about the tugs. <laughs> yep. I don't care about it in here. I just need to get out. <laughs> and then, uh, so, yeah, that was great to see. Again, no, no real major issue. I mean, the, co the canine combine, round one for you guys, went almost as smooth as round one could go for any dog, let alone an underdog. I mean, to put things in perspective, you yourself may not even know this. You guys finished in two minutes, five seconds, which was the fastest time of the night. So you, you beat every police dog in round one uh, by a decent margin, actually. I think the next police dog came in like 30 seconds behind you. So you pretty much, I mean, it's safe to say you kind of destroyed the competition in round one. And... You're in episode two, so we've had 10 dogs appear, eight of which have been police dogs, two underdogs, and I think you had the third fastest time out of the first two episodes combined. So essentially you did better than seven police dog teams in round one, um, which for an underdog that didn't start training till he was two, to be now six years old, to, you know, for this not to be your daily job, it's impressive is what I'm getting at. So kudos to you guys on that. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. So great job on that. Um, and now uh, you find out you're advancing to round two, right? Yeah. Uh, Jamie, Jamie Little, our, our sideline reporter, says, you know, Stan, Rocco, you made it. You're, you're advancing to round two. What, what goes on in your mind right now? <laughs> um, we have to do the least trained objective we've ever done on national TV. <laughs> so, so you were feeling confident in round one. But now you're feeling a little nervous and less confident. Is that safe to say? Yeah, just the lack of experience. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, you know, like you very uh, precisely said, I was guessing more or less. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I, it's, a, it, it's a fact. I mean, you know, hey, and like you said, we train more bite work because it's more fun. We can post it on Instagram, like you said. So, but he knew the scent, so I knew he would try and – I was hoping that I could figure it out for him. And, um, you know, he was been in crated all day. We've done the interviews. We did the first obstacle course. He was wanting a bite. <laughs> so yes. we're going through, um, and there's cameramen around the corners. He's like, ooh, am I biting him? Oh, no, I'm not biting him. Where am I biting at? 
So he's, it was just a, I was really nervous going into it. Why are you doing this? Because we were on TV, baby. <laughs> she doesn't know her dad's famous. <laughs> nah, the dog's famous. He just let me hold his leash. <laughs> but um, we were actually okay until we were about to go in and we heard you and Kurt say, well, he has to find five items in so much amount of time to advance the next round. And I was just hoping we would find one. <laughs> when, you know, Sorry, sorry. So no when problem. we find all five, it was just, you know. So, so yeah, if you guys rewatch um, episode two. Oh, there's the. <laughs> there it is. Uh, so if you guys rewatch episode two, I actually, as you say, I say like, ah, oh, it kind of seems like, you know, they're guessing here. Like, I don't, I don't really see any solid reads from Stan. I don't see any solid behavior changes from Rocco. It kind of seems like they're both kind of guessing. Uh, but what I also pointed out, if you guys rewatch it, is I say, um, you know, being a civilian team that they are, and me knowing how trainers are, you know, if, if detection isn't your wheelhouse, like it is police dogs, and it's their full-time job, you as underdogs or civilian trainers, you're generally going to spend more time on what's cool, on what looks good in videos, on what gets a lot of likes and comments on Instagram, yeah. on what's fun. And that's bite work. Chasing decoys, doing cool stuff, not showing videos of your dog sitting after he smells something in the living room. So, um, and what a lot of people don't realize, as you pointed out, Stan, is in our boneyard, uh, there's cameramen all in there filming, you know, so there's a lot going on. It's open, so air's blowing through, cameramen's running around filming. And then add to that, it's a maze, it's 3,000 square foot, you have a competition, it's going on national TV. So it's kind of chaos going on. Um, so unless you do have a dog and a handler that's very confident and super stable and amazing in detection, even for those guys, it's difficult. So if you're not one of those guys, it becomes really difficult. And you, unfortunately, uh, had an episode that Bear and Kato was in who completely crushed the Boneyard. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Great so, dog, which, great handle. Which is actually rare. I believe Kurt Menefee actually said our first two underdogs, shockingly enough, went five for five in the Boneyard. Uh, because for us, that, that's rare, because the Boneyard is very difficult. So for two teams back-to-back -to, -back to get all five standard items in under five minutes, uh, we didn't have high hopes for the third and fourth person to follow them, is what we were yeah. saying. We figured, you know, maybe you'll get two or three. Maybe the next team will get two or three. We're like, all right, they've set a pretty high standard for the first two teams to go. Um, and unfortunately, as you said, uh, you guys just didn't have a lot of experience going into that. How much scent training did you do up until that point? <laughs> um, probably about a month, once a week. And that's, you know, not, and that was just really getting him on the odors. We weren't doing searches with me. So, you know, just like kind of really imprinting him on odor. Yes. So, you know, again, he, he had a, a leg up on me and I just couldn't do what I should do as a handler. Um, but me and Dan Rhodes were talking, Bears owner. Uh, yep. He said, your dog was working for you. You just had, you know, a lack of experience as a handler. And it's like, oh, okay. So I'm not terrible, but, you know, of course we got more to do. And he was saying they go through several, several, several hours of training, eight days, of, you know, a week, all that good stuff. So it's, he, you know, they definitely had an advantage, but, you know, yeah, of course. Too, and it's going to be fun to see if we can come back and you know, change that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, if you guys don't see, uh, give Stan a follow on his Instagram. I've been following him, and I've seen, you know, now you're you're putting some training in on detection. I see that now. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so you're having to let the same mistake repeat itself. No, no, no. That, <laughs> that just wouldn't be smart, man. That wouldn't be smart. <laughs> And that's what I love to see is is a lot of people, what I love to see about you, Stan, and what I saw on your Instagram, is a lot of people see, see, I know my dog crushed agility. I know my dog's really good at bite work. 
I kind of didn't do that well in detection. So you know what? I'm just going to stick to agility and I'm just going to stick to bite work because that's what we excel at. That's what a lot of people would do. But you did what I would like to think I would do is say, this is where we would not do well. So now you're going to see me do a lot of that. Yeah. So it's beautiful to see that you didn't shy away from where you didn't do well and stick to your strengths. And now you're working on what your weakness was. That's beautiful to see. Yes, sir. So, yeah, definitely keep up the good job on that. And, and with, if we do get a season two and you guys are able to come back, I feel a lot confident, and I'm sure you will too, that you'll probably do a lot better than you did the first time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> and people don't realize, uh, you know, we have, of course, a bunch of trainers that watch our show, a bunch of handlers, a bunch of dog people. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, my dog would crush that. My dog's amazing in detection. But it's easy to say that when you're watching at home. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and that's the beauty that I have being the expert commentator with Kurt Menefee. It's easy for me to pick out the mistakes that people are making when I'm sitting in my comfortable chair watching it live. And I have the comfort of knowing that I don't have the stress. I don't have the pressure. I'm not worried about my dog. I'm not worried about all the things you guys are worried about. I'm just saying, this is where he messed up. This is where he messed up. This is where he did great. Um, so I think that's really important to point out too, is when you guys hear me do my commentary, I take great comfort in knowing better them than me. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's much easier on your couch when you're not in front of the lights. You don't have the audience. You don't have the cameramen running around. It's not 3 a.m. and you've been up all night thinking about this run and how it's going to go and the nerves are getting to you and you're getting iced down and all the stuff's going on that really just doesn't convey through a television. Would you agree? Yes, yes. That's... That's exactly how it is, you know, and you're like, man, you're going to fail on national TV. Everybody's going to hate this, like, and it's like, ah! And, yeah, and that's, yeah, and, and then again, like I said, all the external factors that's going on, there really isn't. We have lights, we have cameramen, we have production staff running around, we have audiences clapping, we have other dogs barking. I mean, it's kind of chaos, and now you throw a 3,000-square-foot maze yeah, five minutes, national television, and then it becomes real chaos. So um, I always give 100% credit to the handlers and the dogs, regardless of how they do, because I'm there to witness it live. And I know and I see the absurd circumstances that people watching at home really don't get to see. So, you know, given all the circumstances, uh, you know, you guys did amazing. I mean, like I said, round one, you de completely destroyed it. First best time of the night, third, I believe, best time ever up until this point. And uh, if you were to do everything all over again, uh, what would you do anything different in round one? Uh, no, I mean, I, couldn't, <laughs> I can't pinpoint anything that we could have done better. I mean, we tried to have more fun, you know, do a backflip into the pool or something like that. <laughs> but, I mean, I just can't think of anything. You know, and I really want to thank, you know, my decoy, Jamil, he came out, my dad came out with us, and I'm over there nervous, like, man, you know, we got to do this, and is he going to do this? And they're just like, Stan, calm down, you know, go out there and play with your dog. When y'all are out there having fun, you know, y'all are amazing, you know, y'all can compete with anybody. When you get nervous and you try to do it this way, y'all do terrible, so don't do that. <laughs> So and, 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 any, and anyone in the dog world knows, and that's, that's kind of the funny thing about our show and kind of the bad thing is anyone in the dog world, whether you, you, know, you do French ring, Mondio ring, Schutzen, canine nose work, agility, whatever it is, your dog will literally do amazing, will do flawless 99 times on the days leading up to the trial or the competition. And then the day of the competition, you walk in with full confidence and they act like they've never done it before in their life. So, <laughs> um, so we see that a lot as well. Um, but yeah, obviously, yeah, I agree. If I was you, I wouldn't change anything on round one. I don't know really where you could have improved. It was a pretty flawless run. And then, of course, in round two, you already knew going into round two that you needed some more work. You needed more time, more repetition. Um, so, and I see you guys putting in the work and time on that now. So, um, you're already, uh, fixing kind of where you went wrong in round two. So that's beautiful to see. And then, um, yeah, like 
how how was your experience being on America's Top Dog? Would, would you would you want to do it again? Man, I, of course, yeah, it was great. Um, you know, we got to meet some really nice people from all parts of the country. You know, and Dan Rhodes in Florida, we went down to one of his competitions. He invited us down there, and it was a ball. Everybody was really nice. Um, Charles and Cato are now in a couple hours. We're gonna make a trip down there and train, do some bite work with them one day. You know, we got um, Ed Shore and Duke and mm -hmm. Austin uh, Martin. He was our alternate on the episode. You know, we, we all just got really close and, you know, we give each other tips and, you know, we still talk to this day since, you know, the filming back this, uh, when we did that. So I would definitely want to experience all that again. And, you know, if we can make some changes where we can do a little better and, you know, make <laughs> a, a, a nice size check at the end of the day. So. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's one of the, the things a lot of people don't realize, too, is uh, we filmed America's Top Dog like six months ago. Um, so a lot of it's just now premiering. So a lot of people, as you can imagine, I've received probably hundreds of DMs saying, hey, when, how can I be on the next show? But we filmed, we finished filming America's Top Dog about six months ago. So now the only way anyone can ever get on again is if we get a season two. And what that requires is you guys watching it, talking about it, sharing it. Um, so if you want a chance to be on America's Top Dog, the literal only way that's possible is by talking about it, sharing it, and watching it so we can get a season two and then you have an opportunity. Um, and being on America's Top Dog alone season one, uh, you know, is a huge compliment to yourself, Stan and Rocco, because, you know, we received, I think it was over, like almost a thousand people um, applied to be on America's Top Dog, and we had 51 competitors. So you guys, you know, were pretty much made it in that top 51 out of a thousand. And then out of that 51, you completely crushed your first round of that 51. So um, you definitely have everything to be proud of. And I know you guys are gonna come back stronger and better. And uh, I'm sure Rocco was, uh, is, is super excited to get back in there as well. <laughs> How's he doing down there? Uh, he, he's just sleeping. So there he is. <laughs> it's like dead weight. Sit up, sit up. There you go, look. There That's he you. is, there's That's the you. star. <laughs> He don't care. <laughs> and uh, everyone loved Rocco, as you see on my Twitter and Instagram, you know, leading up to it. You guys had a huge amount of support leading into it. And then even after, you guys had a huge amount of support. A lot of people even after talked about, oh, we love Stan and Rocco. They are amazing. Um, so, yeah, you guys, yeah, did amazing. And hopefully we get a season two and hopefully yeah. you'll get another shot. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll kind of, uh, we'll take some questions. If you guys want to ask your questions in the comments below, um, it can be for myself, for Stan, it can be for Rocco, and Stan can answer them on his behalf. And uh, yeah, let us know what questions you guys have uh, about anything, really. Uh, Otto says, stand up gentleman right there. Um, Thank you. Otto here, full automatic. He is episode four of America's Top Dog Underdog with his pit bull. So definitely give him a follow. That is two weeks from now. January 29th is Otto's episode. You can see his run. Um, SBD, SPD Canines, who's also a future competitor on America's Top Dog, uh, Officer Michael Garber and his dog Simon, he wants to know, Stan, did the boots hold water after the pull jump? <laughs> So, I just buy the same pair of boots over and over. So these pair, the pair that I wore on the obstacle course, were actually my old pair, and I had a fresh pair for the the bone yard. Oh, so you thought ahead? <laughs> yes, yes. Because I, I knew I was going in the water, and I was wasn't going to waste any time by taking my boots off and sitting them over there nicely. So we were just going right in. So I brought it. I brought an extra pair. Oh, nice. You, you really had the, the round one fall out. You knew you were going to jump the wall. You knew you were going to jump in the water. You knew you had to change out boots. So you had a, you had a real strategy coming in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Canine Bonito <laughs> says <laughs> you cheated and brought two pairs. <laughs> yeah, she knows, she knows the behind the scenes. We had a nice little photo shoot with the boots. Uh, they, they said we were new boot goofing, if you've seen uh, Reno 911. Nice. Let's see what else we have. What other comments? Urs. LLC says Stan and Butch are the greatest trainers I've ever worked with. Hashtag Team Rocco. 
Thanks, Miguel. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks for coming out to the watch party and doing the giveaways. Everybody loves it. Thank you. Uh, Lee uh, Terry seven seven two two says, "How does Rocco like flying on the airplane?" Um, Rocco doesn't mind flying. It's the taking off and the landing. When the engine starts to growl, he's trying to figure out where it's coming from. <laughs> so, other than that, I mean, he he rolls over, and he passes gas, you know, just like a normal dog. <laughs> So he just passes out like he is now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me see what else we have then here. Uh, uh, Lavinia13 says, Hi, Stan from Alexandria, Virginia. We love Rocco. He is a great pit bull. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's one thing really quick I would like to talk about as well um, is – what I really like about like Rocco and Otto being on the show with Pitbulls is you guys really do a great job representing the Pitbull breed. And that's one of the things that I really love. This shows, you know, it kind of uh, negates kind of the stereotype that they get in the media. And it shows that they can be amazing, loving, highly intelligent, highly competitive dogs. Um, and as I've always said, I used to do a podcast with uh, Joe Zitzenberg called The Dog Show with Nick and Joe. And then as Joe says, I became famous and stopped doing it. <laughs> uh, but I always talk about it. You know, one of my favorite breeds is the Pitbull. Um, you know, they constantly rank highest on the AKC temperament testing and uh, all the things that all of you guys know. But that's why I really love that you guys use pit bulls to really showcase them in a positive light and show them, in my opinion, the way that they actually should be displayed to the public, which is how amazing of dogs they actually are. So that's awesome, and kudos to you and Otto for that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, they're built like tanks, and they'll do anything for you. So, <laughs> As you see how amazing they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, that Nepa Nufi says, Nick, we did your OLK9 class and it's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, Dolores says, Annie is amazing too and would love to see Stan run her. Is that another dog you have? Uh, Jim, can you let Oakley up? Yeah, Oakley's my shepherd. Uh, my Western shepherd that Butch was creating. Um, she's a two year old. We're about to let her over here. Come here, babe. Here. Look, gotta get over here. here she is. Oh, she's cute. Yeah. <laughs> so that competition that Dan Rhodes invited her to bring Rocco, and he actually stepped on something and busted up his nail, and we still wanted to go, so we uh, subbed her in for him, and we actually went down there, <laughs> and we had we got third with the thirty second penalty. We couldn't draw our holster, yeah. story, but she's a, just as athletic and just as willing to go through anything as Rocco is. So, you know, hopefully they'll let us run one of the two on season two. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Officer Garber, K9 Simon, future America's Top Dog competitor, said you actually have the fastest run so far uh, in episode one and episode two combined in cowboy boots. <laughs> no one has ran the canine combine faster than you in cowboy boots to date and that actually don't quote me on it because it's, we have a lot of dogs and a lot of episodes but you may hold that record for the entire season of a man stop dog hey you always got to stand out be unique right that's right um let's see uh <laughs> Stan, Annie Oakley is my name too. Great minds think alike. Very nice, very nice. Let's see what else we have on here. Uh, where, where, where are you out of, Stan? What area, where out of, are you in the country? Uh, we are out of uh, Burleson, Texas, off of Rindon, uh, Fort Worth. If it's a bigger city. We're about 45 minutes from Dallas. Uh, Kind of in the middle of the, the heart of Texas. Nice. Is that your hometown where you're from? or? Um, well, my dad was in the military, so I don't really have a hometown. <laughs> but we've been here for, I guess, the longest ever. He retired when I was in the sixth grade. so Nice. Um, I guess this is home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tara Espinosa says hi from Arlington, Texas. That's right down the street. Y'all should come see us on Saturday. We train. <laughs> 
K9 Nitro on Gabby says, how old was Oakley again? Uh, Oakley's a two-year-old. Two-year-old. Fresh. Oh, Oakley. Alaska, hello. Just me, Abby, hello. Uh, Lee Terry says, does Annie Oakley like water? Yeah, she loves water. It'll be a 99-degree a day outside, hadn't rained in a month, and she'd find a puddle. So, <laughs> nice. She loves uh, it. Carp DM Sonia says, my dog was trained by Off Leash Canine Train. He's the best now. Thank you very much for that. Um, hello from Kissimmee, Florida, Vape Princess says. Mm -hmm. um, really quick shout out on that. Next week, this Wednesday, I will be down in Kissimmee, Florida uh, for episode three watch party with John Kundig and his dog Maker, which is the Border Collie in episode one. So look at my Instagram and you guys will see the details for that if you want to come watch an episode with myself, John, and you get a pet and play with amazing Maker, who is uh, episode one's underdog. So check out my ad for that. Uh, Just Me Abby says, we love the underdogs. Oakley is awesome. Uh... Positively, Glenna says, what's next for Stan and Rocco? There's no finish line, so we're just going to continue to, to train, strengthen our communication and our bond, and, you know, hopefully we get some phone calls about coming back and doing some more TV stuff. <laughs> nice. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, K9 and Bonito asked, Nick, what did you think when you saw the course? Um, the funny thing is, when I was approached by A&E about hosting America's Top Dog, and they're like, oh, it's this dog competition. To be honest, I thought it'd be cheesy. I thought <laughs> these are Hollywood producers and executives that really don't know anything about dogs. And then when they showed me, this was before the course was actually built, they showed me the diagrams, like the 3D engineering graphs. I'm like, wow, this is actually a super legit course. And it's way bigger than it looks on TV. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's huge. Huge. Um, So it's a lot bigger than it looks. So I was actually impressed by how big it was and how well designed it was. And what I told them when they asked me what I thought from uh, expert analysis, I said, unarguably, the boneyard, in my opinion, is the hardest part about this entire course. And now that we filmed all of season one, that still is true <laughs> yeah um, so what i initially thought would be the most difficult turned out to be the most difficult but i was actually impressed by the design of the course and how well thought out it was um so yeah that was my initial impression but i love how it tests a little bit of everything it tests the dogs on surfaces textures elevations jumping water um, you know, using their bodies to push through things, detection. So it really was bite work. So it was just kind of an all-around test to see who's America's top dog. I hate to say it, but it's... Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was it was a lot of fun. That's awesome to hear that you guys had a good experience. Uh, bro, big ups to you. We grew up together. Stan, I'm so proud of you. Is BWG Ben underscore P. Uh, Hello, man. What up? That Nepa Nufi says, do they get to run the course before the official TV aired episode? Um, Sam, you can speak to that. Um, yeah, we got to go out and, you know, spend about 10, 15 minutes on, on obstacles so our dogs were familiar with them. Um, but prior to that, no, we had, you know, they sent us a piece of paper where it's like, hey, you may do this, you may do that, you may do this. So you just kind of had to train. You, there wasn't any other than the 15 minutes you got before, the, you know, what, the day before, I think it was. Yeah. No. So, yeah, essentially uh, the, the staff runs the dogs and the handlers through, like, pretty much one test run of the course. So that way the handlers know what to do. Like, uh, what do I do when I get to this car? What do I do when I leave the fire escape? So it was kind of almost a walkthrough on the rules. Yeah. But the dogs, but the kind of, it's kind of good and it's kind of bad because you knew what to expect. But the bad thing is when you do that test run, if your dog doesn't grab a ball or if your dog doesn't jump in the pool, like you just have the next six hours now to think about that <laughs> before yeah. you go on national television. So mm -hmm. I don't think there was a real pro or a con to it. 
Mm -mm. It was kind of a rules walkthrough more than it was a training test run. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Benito says, Nick, did you run any of your dogs on the course? I did not. I was brought out. I was there for almost a month. So I was there for a long time. So I didn't bring my dog. And I have a Belgian Malinois who is almost 12 years old now. Um, so he probably, I probably wouldn't have ran him through the course even if I did have him. So, well, some aspects I would have, but not like the high jumps and stuff like that. Um, Canine Nitro says, will they switch up the course or add things to it? Um, yeah, you'll see uh, there are variations in our course throughout the episodes. Like episode one was a three and a four and a five foot wall jump. Where Stan's episode was a three-foot wall jump, then barrels stacked they have to go over, then a five-foot wall jump. And then there are more course changes, but I'll let you find those out on your own <laughs> as you watch. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Canine Benito says they never crossed the bridge during the walkthrough. So that's what I mean. It really wasn't a test run. It was more of a rules and no. walkthrough. Um, let me see. Tara says, this is such a fantastic show. Definitely my favorite. Thank you, Tara. Hopefully everyone keeps watching so we can get a season two. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Um, what, uh, so this is a great question. Carson Farrington says, I got a mini golden doodle puppy for Christmas. Any training tips? The thing that I love about America's Top Dog, and Stan, I'll let you speak to this as well, is to me, what it does is it sh truly kind of showcases the most stable, confident, well-rounded dogs. And what I speak to a lot of our training clients about is everyone's in such a hurry to get into obedience. I want my dog to come. I want him to heal. I want him to do this. And I'm like, all right, it's a nine-week-old puppy, so calm down. But, um, <laughs> but what I tell everyone, to me, the most important thing that you can do with a dog at a puppy stage is foundational based training, socialization, confidence building, object desensitization, noise desensitization, touch point desensitization, desensitization. Get them used to touching their ears, touching their muscles, touching their tails, touching their paws. Like to me, get them used to noises, surfaces, textures, uh, all of the different objects, different elevations, uh, shaky bridges. Those are the things to me that really, really matter and what truly make great dogs. If you bring me a, a super uh, confident, socialized, great with noises, great with surfaces, great with texture, all of this dog, I've shown, if anyone watches my videos, links in my bio, quick plug, um, I've shown in three days, I can take a dog who knows absolutely nothing and have them awfully shielding on Hollywood Boulevard and the most absurd distractions. But what I cannot do in three days is take your super nervy, unsocialized, <laughs> not stable, fearful of noises, and fix that in three or four days. So I always encourage people to work on the foundational things, the confidence building, the socialization, all those things that actually matter. And if you do that, now when you show up to someone like Stan, myself, Otto, some of the other great trainers in the country, the, the obedience portion is super easy. Just start us with a stable, confident, well-socialized dog. And now our job's easy and your dog and the rest of your life with the dog is easy. So that's my advice, Stan. I, I just echo everything you said there, you know. Uh, <laughs> just really build that bond with them, you know, that trust factor. Show them that they can overcome any obstacle that you put them into. Um, other than that, like you said, get them out in the world and you, know. <laughs> you said everything there. And, and a great example of that, guys, is I could have a dog that I've just been grinding on obedience for a year. But if that dog isn't, you know, super social, stable, noises, desensitized, as soon as it shows up where there's hundreds of screaming people, cameramen running around, lights going around, all that obedience instantly goes out the window. Instantly. Yeah. So that part is the important part. And then the obedience is the easy part. So... That would be my long answer to your very short question. I hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. Let's see. Um, uh, Isabella Shepherd said, I've rescued so many German Shepherds that were damaged because they were not giving good foundational training. Exactly. Um, Holly Sheep says, will there be more for Rocco? Uh, and do you plan to do any more competitions with him in the future? 
Um, yeah, Dan Rhodes again. That's uh, Space Coast competition. I think it's October. Don't quote me on the date. Um, I'm pretty sure Dan will say it in this feed. Um, I'm thinking about taking Rocco and Oakley both down there. So I know that for sure. Um, Oakley, we're going to be going to a, a biathlon in Denmark in May. Um, I think we're running a 5K over there with them nice. at their event. So, I mean, other than that, nothing is penciled in yet, but other than those two. But, hey, if we get a phone call, I mean, <laughs> we like to travel, so. <laughs> Have dog, will travel. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. Um, K9 Benito says Dan's thing is in October. Uh, Ghost the Great says Team Rocco all the way. Uh, so, yeah, if you guys are in the Texas area, uh, the Dallas Fort Worth, Texas area, as I said, definitely give uh, Stan a follow on Instagram. Uh, I followed him. I watch all of his videos. I see the great training he's doing with Rocco and making him better. So, uh, it's definitely good if you want to kind of see some progression and see what Rocco's detection looked like in the boneyard. And now you can compare to some of the stuff Stan's <laughs> doing with him now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, we have been practicing. There is no finish line, guys. <laughs> That's right. Um, so do you have anything that you want to talk about, Stan? Anything you want to plug? Any Anything? Oh, uh, you know, check out our YouTube channel, uh, Capel K9, our Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. We got a TikTok. Um, feel free to message us. If you have questions, let us know. We're here to assist you guys in anything that we can do. And if we don't know, we got some really good people around us that can give us some advice so we can relay that message. Very, very much so. And um, how? what's the easiest way to get a hold of you? If someone wants to work, uh, reach out, work with you, train with you, what's the best way? Um, You can Instagram, whatever is convenient for you. We're on all platforms, all social media and I check them regular, so whatever you're on, we're probably on it too. Um, I am Stan90 on most platforms, and then Stan Smith on Facebook. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, we just had K9 Mattis enter the room. ADPS K9 hey. Mattis. Everyone, give him a follow. Good friend of mine, uh, Mark yep. Tappen, who is hopefully we get to meet him one four. day. He's an episode four competitor with his dog K9 uh, Mattis, which is January 29th. So definitely give uh, K9 Mattis a follow, and you'll see them competing in episode four, which is not this Wednesday, but next one, the following Wednesday. Yeah, he's going to be on there with Otto, so it's going to be yep. another Pitbull and Mattis. So that's right. That'll be an action pack, so it will be a good episode. Uh, and a uh, quick shout out: the last one I'm going to give is this Wednesday coming up. This Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you guys have loved America's Top Dog so far, this is an episode you do not want to miss. We have Belgian Malinois, German Shepherds, and then our underdog is a dog. You've probably seen him in the trailers. You've seen him in the highlight reels. Minion, who's a 14-inch tall, 28-pound <laughs> dog who is going to be competing against highly trained, highly experienced, Belgian Malinois, German Shepherd, police dogs. And I know everyone in the canine world is like, how is this possible? Uh, this dog barely comes up, you know, halfway past your shins. Yeah. How, there's no way he's going to do these three, four, five, five foot wall jumps. So you definitely want to tune in to see how all this plays out. Um, it's, I think, an amazing episode. And then that episode is followed by Otto in the comments below and Mark Tappen. So definitely check that out. Um, let me run through a few of those. Uh, K9 Benito says, hey, Mattis. Uh, Mattis says, enjoyed watching Rocco and Stan. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hopefully we get to meet you guys one day. Uh, and actually, Mark, ADPS K9 Mattis, is having a watch party where you guys can show up, meet Mark, and meet Mattis. So give them a follow for that information. Uh, Little Seaster says, loving the show. Thank you very much. We appreciate your support. It can't be better. K9 Benito says it can't be better than episode two. Right. Uh, I know right. it's going to be great. <laughs> K9 Benito was a competitor in episode two, so she may be slightly biased, but episode two was amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with you, Don. Uh, C. Jameson says one of the best shows on TV. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Lee yep. Terry says Canine Fuse is also January 29th. Yes, Deputy Cole, Canine Fuse, amazing Belgian Malinois, also on the same day. So if you guys don't have any questions for us, do you have anything else, Stan, that you want to talk about? No, nah, check out the season, you know, hashtag Team Rocco so we can come back on season two. You know, let them know that y'all want to see us. <laughs> there uh, you go. I appreciate you taking your time, Nick, and talking with us for this hour. And, you know, we'll hopefully I get to shake your hand one day as well. For sure. And I appreciate you coming on. You know, I love getting some, uh, the getting in the mind of the handlers that were on the show, what was going through their mind, what went right, what went wrong. So we appreciate your time. And hope to see you again. And uh, I'm sure that I'll be out in Texas some point and we'll hook up and do some training together. All right, man. Sounds right. good, dude. Later, brother. Thanks, right, guys. See you guys. Bye.